notes in there. You can post to social media from there. Okay, so there's a lot of a lot of cool stuff in that app. I think it's an amazing, amazing feature. This morning we begin a new three-week series called "The Search for Happiness," We're talking about thankfulness and contentment as leading up to the holidays. The big one, which is the big one. Thanksgiving, isn't it? Ain't the other one. It's Thanksgiving, all right? That's the big one, just in case you were wondering. Thanksgiving is a big holiday where we get to eat and eat and eat some more, and it's absolutely delicious, and then we come back for leftovers. Yes. The big idea of the series this morning, this three-week series, is designed to highlight the relevant and important topics of happiness and contentment. Now, of course, happiness means something different to everybody, right? Everybody, we all have our own definition of what happiness is. Of course, our society tries to find happiness in maybe a new job or material possessions or sometimes a significant other. But as we look at the message this morning in these next couple of weeks, we're going to look at what does the Word of God talk about when it comes to happiness. Sometimes we have this idea that God doesn't want you to be happy. That's not true. God wants you to be happy. But with contentment, there's a difference. Okay, you need to be content, not not this happily. You're always laughing, and no matter what life throws at you, you're just always laughing. I, I worry about people like that <laughs> and wonder what kind of drug they're on. Okay, because you know sometimes it's okay to not be okay. Sometimes we've had difficulties. Sometimes we walk through some fire and through some flood, and sometimes literally through fire and through flood. Okay. But God helps us and walks us through all that. But today we're going to look at 1 Timothy chapter 6, starting at verse 6. Yet true godliness with contentment is itself great wealth. After all, we brought nothing into this world, right? Nothing with us when we came into the world. We can't take anything with us when we leave it. So if we have enough food and clothing, let us be content. But people who long to be rich fall into temptation and are trapped by many foolish and harmful desires that plunge them into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, and some people craving money have wandered from the true faith and pierced, them, pierced themselves with many sorrows. The letter was written by the aging Apostle Paul to his young protege Timothy, a young man, pastor in the ministry. And so the theme of this letter right here, what we're looking at, is focusing on some false teachers that had come into the congregation in the church of Ephesus and had started teaching about uh, getting rich quick and that God wants you to be rich. God wants, sounds very familiar. God wants you to be wealthy and if you give enough offering, God's going to really bless you back and God wants to prosper you. God wants you to be wealthy and, you know, just this crazy message and this was happening Early on in the church, the, the church had just started, basically, and there were already false teachers saying, hey, we can use this to make money. Mm. And so they were talking about making money through godliness, and that was not working, of course. And so Paul writes to Timothy, which was one of his young pastors who made the, the circuit around those areas, and he's correcting some false doctrine and talking about what contentment really looks like, what happiness really looks like the big idea of the message that in a culture where many are focused on what they don't have, God calls us to focus on His spiritual provision. The application point is don't lust after wealth. Instead, be content with what God has given you. You know, it seems like everybody is in search of something. And we are in search of the elusive that elusive happiness. We've got, to, we've got to get that. We've got to find that. And so just a, a week or two ago, uh, millions, millions across America were buying lottery tickets at what was being billed the largest, ended up being the second largest winning lottery in our history. 1.5 billion, I didn't say millions, <laughs> billion dollar jackpot that's obscene that's an obscene amount of money okay 1.5 somebody won it I think in South Carolina it's one of those states where you can remain anonymous if you won that you would need to remain anonymous I'll tell you that right now 
Okay, but everybody wanted to buy a ticket or twenty dollars of tickets or a hundred dollars of tickets. There were office people going around and all making a pool and say, "Hey, let's all go in. Everybody put in a dollar or five dollars, and we'll all, we'll split the jackpot." Why? Because we're in search of happiness. We think that having how many of you think having one point five billion dollars would make you happy? <laughs> it would make you happy for a very short time. Okay? Just just as long until the IRS comes knocking at the door. And the behind the IRS is your pastor knocking at the door. <laughs> and then everybody else, every family member, every every lost cousin, every uncle, every person you ever friended on Facebook will be knocking at your door. And then you would find out what true ministry is, right? Oh, yeah. 1.5 billion. We also have a caravan, by the way, is a political hot button issue today. Yeah. Have a caravan of thousands and thousands of people marching down, marching up, I guess I should say, marching up from Honduras and El Salvador in search of a better life. You know, they, they, they want they want that Amer they want a piece of the American pie, they want that American dream, and so they're they're just so frustrated with their own situation that they feel like if we can just get to the promised land. I mean, you know America is still the promised land yes. for much of the world. Yes. Still very much a place where you, you can make things happen, right? Yes. And so they're marching in hopes of finding happiness. This Tuesday, millions, if you haven't done so already, you should, okay? Millions are heading to the polls this Tuesday in hopes of securing their version okay, of what happiness is. Then, of course, there's a darker side of trying to find happiness when we try to find it in, you know, uh, alcohol, candy's candy, the liquor's quicker. <laughs> Anybody know where that quote's from? <laughs> Somebody knows where the quote's from. Thank you. The movie. Willy Wonka, believe it or not. <laughs> okay. Willy Wonka, the ah. yeah, just a river of chocolate. Oh my gosh. Fountains and fountains of chocolate and edible flowers and lick the wallpaper. Snozberry flavor. Oh, I'd be happy, right? So we went to the doctor. <laughs> He'd say, why did you balloon? How did you balloon up to this level? Uh, relationships and there's drugs uh, for some of us a little, uh, some, some extra retail therapy will buy us a little bit of happiness just a little bit right especially when they're on sale and on clearance Woo. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> interestingly enough in late 1700s one of our most important founding documents of this nation the Declaration of Independence begins with these words. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, and they are endowed by the, their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed, and that whenever any form of government becomes destructive to these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or abolish it and to institute new government, laying its foundation on such principles and organizing its powers in such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. As I said, a lot of people are going to the voting because they're, they're wanting a certain version of this country that they feel will bring them the most happiness. Well, this government, the way it is now, is not bringing me a lot of happiness. So I need to vote to change things. And that's how we try, attempt to do that. In reading up a little bit about this, it said uh, later on in a different document that was commenting on that, it said private happiness and public happiness and moral goodness, Locke, Jefferson, and others learned from ancient philosophers, especially, especially Aristotle, that these choices have ethical or moral dimensions. Those without moral virtue cannot be happy. I thought that was interesting. Many of our choices have social consequences and therefore have a civic dimension when they enhance or subtract from public happiness. Thus, the pursuit of happiness must refer both to public and to private happiness. I thought that was an interesting take on the interpretation of some of that. So the first thing that we look at this morning is that we tend to lose out on true happiness 
when we get to focus on what we don't have. This is what the lottery is all about, by the way, focusing on what you don't have. That's exactly what it is about. He says in verse 7, we brought nothing into this world and we can't take nothing out, although that doesn't stop people from trying to take it with them. You've seen the stories, somebody buried in their absolute beautiful brand new Mercedes Benz. They wanted to be buried in it in the driver's seat, encased in cement, so that nobody would come and try to steal the car, which, you know, that, yeah, that's just nuts, right? Um, but, you know, that's not anything new. I mean, the pharaohs were doing it. They were, you know, if you served in, in some of these guys' courts in the pharaohs of Egypt, uh, and, and you better pray that the guy doesn't die because they would bury the servants. They would, in, well, what? They would entomb the servants, their gold, their riches, and all this kind of stuff. And then the servants would, would be locked in the tomb, and then they would seal them all up. So that when he resurrected in the afterlife, he'd have all these servants with him. But they died too. Wow. So, I mean, they were trying to take it with them. Right? They were always trying. There's, there's always this push that, you know, everything I have, I just need to take it with me and I need to have it. You, anybody have a dream where, where, where you, when, when I was a kid, you probably had this. You're dreaming about candy, especially this time of year. <laughs> candy, right? Yeah. And you're like in, in, in a, a river of candy. <laughs> and, and you're grabbing candy and you're shoving it in your pockets. And, and you know, uh, or maybe gold or money. As you get older, it changes from candy to gold, by the way. <laughs> right? Gold coins. Or, or I remember as I got older, it started changing from candy to dollar bills. Right. And I remember one dream, and I was just grabbing all the... Oh, and I knew I was dreaming. This is the crazy thing. I knew I was dreaming. I thought, man, I'm in this dream, and there's all this money everywhere. I'm taking this stuff with me, man. I was just grabbing it, and, and I woke up with my hands like this. <laughs> Empty. <laughs> Empty. There was nothing there. It's like, no. <laughs> right? Am I the only one? Anybody else have that dream? It's a common dream, right? Nobody. What? Candy? Money? Gold? Diamonds? Diamonds. <laughs> I knew I was going to hit it somewhere along the line, right? You wake up just grabbing all of that, and you just, I've I got to take it with me when I wake up. This is going to be so awesome. And you wake up with nothing, and that's kind of what we're talking about this morning. He says in verse 8, if we have enough food and clothing, then let us be content. Now, of course, the, the interpretation, those of you in, in our seniors' Bible study on Tuesday morning, we'll talk about the interpretation, how Jesus had issues with the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. These were for a lot, they, these were doctor, these guys had doctors, doctorate in theology, okay? And even with all that, you had the Pharisees and you had the, the Sadducees, and they actually had opposing views in some things, and yet they were all doctors in theology, and they understood the word. Then you had the lawyers who were always looking for a loophole and finding a way to get around all the, the laws and so forth. So they were always trying to find the loop. Those were the teachers of the law. And so when we look at the scripture, we read verse 8. If we have enough food, if there was teachers of the law here, we'd say, well, you have to define what enough is. Because what's enough for you may not be enough for me. Certainly when it comes to food. Yes? Yeah, what's enough for you may not... I may need to have a double meat patty. I said need. I said, that's right. I said need. I may need to have that. Okay? The big one. And the supersized fries. And the gallon of soda. I may have to have that just for lunch. But we have to decide what is enough food and what is enough clothing so that we can be content. The whole lottery thing is focusing on what we don't have. And we always talk about, you know, if we only made a little bit more money, whatever amount of money you make now in your job, if you just made a little bit more, you would be, we say something, sometimes we even say it aloud, man, if I could just make a little bit more, I'd be all right. If I could just make a little bit more, if I could just get that bonus, if I could just get that raise, I would be in la-la land. I would be so happy, right? And so you get in debt for how much the raise was, and then next year you're doing the same thing. Oh, if I just make a little bit more money, right? It's this never-ending cycle. So when we do that, when all our time is spent on looking at what we don't have, we actually end up missing out on what we do have. And so if some of you have done the challenge, or maybe you're doing it now on social media in the month of November, every day, right, you post one thing that you're thankful for. Anybody doing that right now on social media? Oh, you unthankful person. <laughs> I don't go on social media. You don't even have social media. What are you doing? How did you get in here? <laughs> Just kidding. 
But they're taking this challenge where every day, every morning, you know, they get on their Facebook or Instagram and they post, today I am thankful for, and you do that for the whole month of November, okay? And you post what you're thankful for that day. When we stop being thankful, when we stop giving thanks to God for what we have, we start focusing on what we don't have. If I just had this, and I did post yesterday uh, a picture of me on my red motorcycle, which I sold that motorcycle a year ago, I think it was. And, uh, it, you know, being close to the Lone Star Rally, and I was down in Galveston uh, visiting someone, and, uh, you know, motorcycles everywhere. It's like, oh, if I just had that motorcycle, not only would I look cool, I would be happy. Right? Driving up and down, see all that beautiful sunshine and all that stuff. But, you know, it's just an illusion, right? We think that if we had this or if we had that certain car or lived in a certain neighborhood, made a certain amount of money, that somehow that, that would be okay. If we had the perfect person that we were married to, right? Oh, y'all scared to say that? <laughs> y'all scared? That's okay. I understand. Okay. So we look at this scripture and then he goes on to talk about how having wealth really is not a sin according to the word of God. It's not a sin. The problem is when we become so focused on becoming rich that we allow ourselves to fall into temptation. Verse 9 says, but people who long to be rich fall into temptation and are trapped by many foolish and harmless desires that plunge them into ruin and destruction. Riches have an inerrant deceitfulness about, it, about them. In the parable of the sower, and I want you to read this in Matthew chapter 13, verse 22. Jesus is talking about the parable of the sower. The sower went out to sow, right? And then he explains to the disciples the meaning of the parable. When he gets to verse 22, he says this. The seed that fell among the thorns represents those who hear God's word, but all too quickly the message is crowded out by the worries of this life and the lure, it says, the lure of what? Of wealth. The lure of wealth so no fruit is produced. So I wanted to look at that particular verse. The King James says the deceitfulness of riches, there's a deceitfulness that is inerrant in money. And I thought that was pretty interesting. I'm going to read a couple of others. The good news says, the love for riches chokes the message. The common English Bible says, the false appeal of wealth chokes the word and it bears the fruit. The message says it this way. The weeds of worry and illusions about getting more. And wanting everything under the sun, strangle what was heard, and nothing comes of it. The amplified, the deceitfulness, or the superficial pleasures and delight of riches choke the word, and it yields no fruit. So Jesus, in this parable of the sower, is actually warning in this particular part about chasing after money, chasing after wealth, chasing after riches. Now, we all want to live well. We all want to make good money. That's normal, right? It's normal. It's okay. That's in us to want to better our situation. But, you know, there comes a point where you, you have to check yourself and make sure that you're not trying to satisfy something inside you by going after more stuff, right? You've heard me talk about uh, going to Stuff Mart and getting all this stuff. And then when you have so much stuff, you filled up your garage, which is supposed to be for your cars. But your garage is where you can't put your car in because it's all full of stuff. And then you have so much stuff that you got to go down to the stuff storage and rent two or three stuff storages and put all the extra stuff that you can't possibly fit anywhere else. And so you put them over there. Maybe you built a little shed out back to put more stuff in it. And before you know it, you're just stuffed out. Right? <laughs> You just got stuff coming out the wazoo. You're stuck everywhere. <laughs> but yet we want more stuff. I remember going into a lady's house. And I didn't realize it. That was a, years ago. I was a plumber's helper for a very short time. <laughs> and uh, we went to this lady's house to do some gas work on the heaters. And, and the guy that I was working with, he said, hey, it's going to freak you out when you go in there. Okay, I'm just letting you know. Like, okay, I didn't know what to expect. Right? So I walk in, and there's everywhere that there's a flat surface. The sofas, the tables, the, the, the kitchen table, every chair, every nook and cranny was loaded down with stuff. But get this, it was all brand new stuff. Brand new stuff, still with tags, in their bags, with receipts. The tables, the yes, we went into a bedroom, the whole bed was covered. The floor was covered, the dresser was covered with bags. 
new bags from Stuff Mart. All this stuff, and there were receipts in the bags, right? You could just take them and take the stuff back and get the cash. I mean, there must have been tens of thousands of dollars worth of stuff just everywhere. He looks at me, up, you know, he saw my face, and he says, I think she has a problem. You think? You think? <laughs> you think she's got a problem? My goodness. Because it, the retail therapy can go crazy, right? You can just get too much retail therapy because you think that that satisfies, and it, it probably is a medical condition, I'm sure it is, where it just, you think it brings you this adrenaline and rush of buying something, and then as soon as it wears off, then you have to go do it again. So Jesus says there's a deceitfulness that is inerrant in, in wealth, and there's this lure of wealth. It promises money, promises security, but it really can't deliver. It promises peace of mind, but it is temporary. It promises happiness, but it is fleeting. It promises strength, but it has done. In Proverbs 23, 5, when you set your eyes upon it, talking about money, it is gone for sure. Riches make themselves wings like an eagle <laughs> that flies toward the heavens. And the modern version is, people say the money talks, all mine ever says is, goodbye. <laughs> That's what that scripture is basically saying. That when you put your mind on chasing after that, the goal keeps getting moved. I think that's the most frustrating thing. That when you're, you're trying to chase after finance, you're trying to chase after those possessions, that the goal keeps getting moved. Because as soon as you get that goal, you look up and you're like, wait, I, I know I just made it, but now the goal is over there. Yeah. Right? How did that happen? Well, then I've got to work harder. I've got to work more hours, and I've got to do whatever i got to do, because i got to get to that goal. Because my friend across the street, he's already at that goal, and i got to get to that goal i got to keep up with him, right? And then you get to that goal, and you look up, and you're like, hey, who moved the goalpost? And there's this never-ending desire to constantly chase after that crazy illusion. It's like a mirage, isn't it? That's what Jesus is talking about, that it just keeps getting moved. Billy Graham said this, we are rich in the things that perish, but poor in the things of the Spirit. We are rich in gadgets, but poor in faith. We are rich in goods, but poor in grace. We are rich in know-how, but poor in character. We are rich in words, but poor in deeds. Jesus said that our life does not consist in the material possessions we have. Our peace of mind, our joy, our happiness, our comfort, and our eternal destiny does not depend on our earthly possessions. Thank God. You've seen the bumper sticker, He Who Dies with the Most Toys Wins. Has anybody seen that one? There's another one that says, he who dies with the most toys dies anyway. Can't take it with you. The constant chasing after that thing. And finally, we finish with money is simply just a tool. As with many things in life, money is simply a two-sided coin. It can be used for God's glory to bring people to himself or it can lead to a person's downfall. The whole thing about the, the lottery is very, very simple. Okay, there was a, on Air One, I was listening to it when they were doing this whole lottery. That whole week, they were talking about the lottery. And so they started asking their listeners, what would you do with that kind of money to call in and let us know? And of course, everybody's calling in. And you know, there's, oh, I'd pay off my house. I'd pay off my car. You know, I'd, I'd pay the bills. I'd bless, you know, the church. I'd give to chair. You know, the, the standard answer were, were, were the same. You know, I'd buy this. I'd buy, you know, just, we, we've all, we all got that. You know, that's our checklist. We all have it. Anybody have a checklist in case you win the big one? Anybody? Have you ever thought about that? Have you ever said, oh, one point five billion? Wow, right? That's just that's just obscene. This is so much money. You could do so much with that. But here's the crazy thing about it: as they were talking on this show, they started shifting the conversation, which I really enjoyed. This the, the call in every day. They changed the conversation. They said, "Okay, we've been asking, what would you do with that money?" And people have been giving us all these wonderful answers. Now we want to ask you, what can you do about it now? with what you're making now. Can you do some of those things that y'all called in about, but can you do it on what you're making now? Because the chances are you win the lottery, <laughs> right? Basically, they were saying, there's gonna be a whole lot more losers <laughs> than there's gonna be winners. So those desires that you have, like to give to charity, or to help somebody in need, or to get out of debt, or whatever it is, can you do that now? See, here's the thing about money, and about the whole lottery business, is that all it does, all money does is magnify whatever you are. Whatever person you are, whatever character traits are inside you right now, right? 
whatever kind of, of, of temperament, whatever whatever's inside of you right now, all that a lot of money does is magnify it. So if you're kind, you're going to be very kind. If you're a giver, you're going to be a big giver. Right? If you like to help people in need, then you're going to really help a lot of people in need. But if you're greedy and you like to buy stuff, you're going to buy a whole, your toys are just going to get bigger. Uh, went to, I want to say it's a toy store, okay? But it's a, it's a hobby shop for big boys like me, okay? And they had model airplanes. No, not model airplanes like that. Scaled. Huge model airplanes. I mean, yeah. and, and tanks. I saw a tank. I wondered if it was wondering if it would shoot out real bullets or something. That thing was an enormous sailboat, a huge, gorgeous sailboat. You know, and you're talking about hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of dollars. You know, I just walked around going, wow. Ooh. Oh, look at that. Ooh, I like that sailboat. And, Oh, I mean, it's just a toy. They say the difference between the men and the boys is the price of their toys. So whatever is inside you is simply going to be magnified by the amount of money that you have. And so if we love the Lord and we win that lottery, we hope that it doesn't destroy us. That chasing after that stuff. Do we have to wait till I hit the lottery to start doing good? Maybe, maybe some of us may need to actually work less to invest more in the thing that actually does matter. People and relationships. My dad was a hard, hard working man. He had nine kids, plus he took care of his dad. There's a whole story there when my, my grandfather, my, my dad got saved, okay, became a Christian. He got kicked out of his home. The first person he went to the Lord was his dad. He got kicked out of his home. And so Grandpa lived with our family for like 18 years until he passed. But Dad worked hard all his life. And we were, one, one time, you know, I was already grown. We were having a conversation about, how, you know, just money and different things. He, and he just would, you know, this is a conversation I think every parent has with their kids. You know, I've worked hard to give you things that I did not have. Anybody ever said that already? Yes. <laughs> yes. I worked hard to give you what I did not have. And I remember saying to my dad, I said, yeah, but you ever thought that maybe what we wanted was more of you? That maybe you could have just worked a little bit less and we would have had a little bit less stuff, but we would have been okay with that. And we would have had more time, you know, to toss the old football around. Hang out and let's go fishing, right? Because that's what really matters. So in, the, in this race, you know, the rat race, if you win the rat race, you're still a rat. You know that, right? <laughs> in this race, it, that's life, and we're chasing after stuff. Sometimes in the process, the collateral damage is huge. And we may not realize that what we're losing out is investing in relationships with those that we say are our priority. With the wary ones that we say, I love you so much. I've had this conversation with several family members, the people that I have ministered to as a hospice chaplain, okay? And uh, there's some, some of our older generation, the way that they, they said love to their family by, was by working 18-hour days. That's all they understood, right? And I had one person who was saying, oh, but I worked so hard to get my kids, and I worked, and I worked, and, and, and that's all the kids remember. Dad worked all the time. That's all they remember at the funeral. Oh, Dad, he worked all the time. He was always at work. He's always working. We're talking about working, right? He was always work, 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 work. And I thought, how sad. How sad that that's what they remember most. I mean, I'm glad he was a good worker. I mean, yeah, we want you to be a good, hard worker. But if doing that because you're chasing the, the almighty dollar and chasing material possessions... In the process, you lose out on building a relationship with your son or your daughter or your spouse even. Then you've really given up a whole lot more than you realize just to have stuff. The stuff is fleeting. It's passing. It's going to rot. It's going to rust. It's going to get stolen. Yes. It's going to get stolen. I hate to tell you, my son's, one of my son's dreams uh, recently were stolen a few days ago. He's uh, starting a, a business doing video work. 
and uh, he had all his camera equipment, all this stuff stolen out of his car while he was eating lunch. Uh, and it just, it broke our hearts. It's like, he was just, I mean, got some contracts and was doing beautiful work and getting paid for it. And then in a moment, I thought, wow, and I'm preaching on this this morning. <laughs> That, that all that stuff you can lose in a moment but when you're standing on a rock and those waves of life pound and they pound hard guess what when you build your house on the rock you're going to still be standing and all that stuff God promises the children of Israel he said I will give you what the worms have taken away he said I will give back to you even more so and I believe I'm calling that out on my son's life, David, that God will replace all that and more in the name of Jesus because he knows he was trying to do good. So I, I know God will take care of him and do all that. Let me just close off. There's a couple more quotes, but I really want to read this one by uh, one of the spiritual directors of Henry Nguyen. If you've never read any of Henry Nguyen's work, you should give a pop, find some books of his. <clears throat> Way back in the day, he called them uh, Desert Fathers. If you don't know anything about Desert Fathers, then you, you probably ought to pick up a book or two about Desert Fathers. And they, they just have a lot of wisdom to impart. Henry Neal was one of those. Can we put that quote up? That last one, I think it's the last quote. I love this prayer. One of his spirit directors prayed over Henry Neal. And I just, every time I read it, I, I just want to weep and I get before the Lord and I say, Lord, man, you trust what you got to do. It says, may all your expectations be frustrated. May all your plans be thwarted. May all your desires be withered into nothingness. Mm -hmm. That you may experience the powerlessness and poverty of a child. And sing and dance in the love of God the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. Mm -hmm. I think about that prayer and I think, if I lost every possession, every material possession, I want to still be able to lift my hands and say, God, you're so good. Mm -hmm. You know what? Job did that. What a nut. He's crazy. <laughs> he lost every, in a moment, he lost everything. The man was wealthy. Wealthy. He lost everything and pretty much everybody except his wife. And the Bible says he bowed before the Lord and he worshiped. He said, I, he said exactly what we just read. He said, I came naked into this world, and that's the way I'm going to leave. He said, but I'm okay with that because I trust him. I love him. If you want to chase after something that's worth catching, be a God chaser. Chase hard after the presence of the Lord. Because there's, remember a, a prophet years ago, but he had a vision, and he was ushered into the presence of the Lord. He was standing there just with his mouth open. And the Lord said to him, son, ask me for anything, anything, anything you want. I want to I want to give that to you because you've been so faithful. I want to give that to you. And he, in his vision, he said he just broke down and began to weep. And he said, Lord, all I want is you. And it was like the whole thing with Solomon where God said, because you want me, you get everything else gets thrown in. <laughs> what? I chose the right, I'll take door number three. He chose the right door. <laughs> he chose the right door. He said, you know what? All that is just stuff. I just want to be in your presence. That's all I want. And in doing so, he found peace and joy and love that is unexplainable and unimaginable. I hope that as we look at all this stuff and when we talk about the lottery, we all talk about that stuff. We talk about making a little bit more and spending a little bit more and all that stuff. And, you know, we all do that. But in this month of thankfulness, as we get closer to Thanksgiving, how about we just start counting all the stuff we already have? Yes. And the people that love us and the people that are around us and the, and the things that God has already blessed us with and say, you know what, if you got, God, if you never gave me anything else. I don't know who it was who said you know, that they had won the lottery because they were born in the USA. And I said, I won the lottery when I became a citizen of the USA. Greatest country on earth. We're so blessed. We're so blessed to be here. People are clamoring to get in. 
And we're already here enjoying the blessings of God. We ought to be very, very thankful. Amen. Father, we just come before you thanking you for your love and mercy. And God, we just ask that you help us not to chase after material things, not to chase after more stuff. Father, maybe we need to divest ourselves of some stuff. Maybe we need to get rid of some stuff. Maybe we need to have a garage sale, a fire sale, or just give it all away to charity so that we are not beholden to anything. So our hearts are not so entwined in the stuff of this world that we lose sight of who we are. We're just passing through, God. We're just passing through. And we want to touch people. We want to love people in such a way that they'll want to join us on this journey called faith. And we want to just chase you, God. We're chasing after you this morning. Father, I ask that you forgive me for sometimes chasing the wrong thing. Sometimes taking my eyes off what is truly the prize and putting it on, on material and just stuff money and all that other junk. God, just strip me down before your presence. So, well, there's nothing left but me and you. And I'm holding on tight to you, Father. Thanks so much. Just talk to Jesus this morning. Just talk to your Heavenly Father. Just tell them what's in your heart. Right there where you're at. You're 